Hello again, and welcome to another edition of Decentral Lounge, the podcast presented by Global Stake, your true bare metal infrastructure grade provider. Today, we are very happy to welcome a really interesting guest, Patrick Dunlop, who is the co-founder and CEO of Jackal Labs, which is a blockchain solutions and innovation company and more uh, famously known for Jackal Protocol, which is a decentralized storage solution that is being built on the blockchain. And so we're happy to speak with you today, Patrick. Welcome to the show. And to start off, uh, why don't you just give us a little bit about your history and how you got interested in the Web3 space even to begin with? No, I really appreciate it, Ryan. So my background is I started in digital forensics and investigations for law firms and corporations and governments. Um, early in the early days of the Wild Wild West, we call it blockchain, or some people call it Web3. Um, there's these things called flash loan attacks, and this was crazy back in uh, 2017, where people would exploit um, vulnerabilities that were financial and then uh, run away with a bunch of money. So uh, back then, there was no way for a lot of police agencies didn't really take cases because they didn't understand. And even if they did, sometimes you get to the Crown Prosecutor up here in Canada, for example. Um, and they wouldn't take the case because they don't understand. So a lot of the stuff was done civilly and we'd be brought in to kind of investigate those. And that's how I got my start with blockchain technology. Um, at the beginning, I thought it was silly, <laughs> if I'm being honest with you. Uh, it, it wasn't something that I was uh, too keen on. But the more that we got to know the low level foundation of the technology, uh, we understood a ton of use cases with it. And that kind of led us into this company where we started, we were trying to build like an e-discovery tool for court use. Um, with digital evidence, it's really hard to track and trace chain of custody of who has access to what evidence at what time. Obviously the physical evidence, you can take gun and put it in the bag and then write on the bag that I handed it to Ryan and Ryan handed it to someone else. You can track it all the way to the bench that way. But with digital files, it's a little bit more complicated, right? Um, you have uh, copies of the files and everyone's working on their own copy and it's getting sent to the other opposing counsel and then it's getting sent back and then it gets to court. And then the file would be like created yesterday. And that's not like a true forensic environment. And the, it's a copy of a copy. And then often it would get thrown out. Uh, so we said, you know what? This blockchain technology is really good for knowing who has what things at what time. This is pretty fascinating because it's kind of like a magic spreadsheet that's never wrong. And with this magic spreadsheet in hand, people did things in the area of money and finance and lending and NFT craze and then governance and voting, but uh, we saw an opportunity to do stuff with data of um, really, really secure data storage environments and transfer environments with chain of custody and granular control. So uh, we started building this forensic e-discovery tool. Uh, one thing led to another, and then we ended up building a public cloud environment where uh, only the end users with the private keys have access to um, their data. Which kind of gets into a few things, right? It's uh, why, like, at the end of the day, all of us ask us, like, okay, like you can take this magic spreadsheet and you can slap it on a ton of things. You can slap it on the governance and the money. But when we started looking deeper, the competitive advantages and almost unfair advantages that we have, you have pricing power, you have sovereignty, you have ownership, low platform risk, it's efficient, it's open source, uh, it's resilient. The global cybersecurity and digital privacy posture can increase if we use this technology in a certain way. So um, no admin overhead, no CapEx overhead by bootstrapping with incentives. And uh, most importantly, there's just no centralized choke points of failure. Right. And having something like that, it's uh, stacking all these unfair advantages, give it so many unique opportunities. But uh, the question is, is how will the technology mature? Uh, will the user experience get better over time? Will it be more usable over time? Will the wallet experience get better over time? So uh, it's just one day at a time for us and just trying to make the best product possible. No, that's really interesting. I mean, just even backing up one more step, I mean, what got you into digital forensics? It seems like such an interesting title and, and a field. Yeah. Um, something that preceded even your blockchain history. Yeah, so I went to university for human kinetics, actually, believe it or not. So I was going to be a chiropractor or something along those lines or maybe something in, uh, in physiotherapy or something like that. But uh, in my fourth year, I started learning how to program in Python uh, because I was helping my father out with a few projects. And he runs, he's an ex-police officer, and uh, he has a lot of experience where when he retired, he opened a 
intelligence company where we, they would do a lot of work for law firms on the defense side or civil stuff. Um, that being said, he needed help on the digital front because uh, longer gone are the days of just private investigators and trench coats following people around. Um, it got to the point where people were more online than offline and he needed support with that. So I started really learning. I got a bunch of certifications in that. And that's kind of was my introduction into uh, just working in blockchain is actually have to hand it over to him. But that was my introduction also to uh, just digital forensics field. And I worked with some awesome people over there, including my co-founder, Marston, who uh, we kind of started working together in that field specifically. Well, that's interesting. That kind of takes us to the, the point where you start Jackal Labs. I mean, uh, what was it about like meeting him and then starting to get these burgeoning realizations about the power of blockchain? How was that that, that led to the creation of Jackal Labs? Yeah, it, it just kind of it came down to uh, we understood the technology. We didn't like it at first, but then we understood a bunch of use cases. And then uh, we were trying to kind of curate different products internally for our internal use. And then we said, wait a second, um, we were looking at the underlying infrastructure for us to build the products that we wanted to build wasn't there. And that was kind of the step into the direction of, okay, now we can actually start to build an engineering firm around this. We can actually start building these products and uh, just bringing them to market. And that's kind of how uh, the birth of the Jackal protocol we were using different tech stacks and it's gone through all kinds of different revisions along the way, but it's gotten to the point recently where it truly is the only self custodial cloud environment with a clean forensic environment at the same time where no one other than the end user with their private key can access their data. It's kind of like, um, when you use the cloud, it's someone else's computer, right? And uh, it being someone else's computer, you have all the permissions and the passwords and the username is, has to be trusted by a third party. Um, the need for trust and the need for using like the age of SaaS where everything's as a service rather than kind of doing everything locally yourself um, for obvious like scalability, it's cheaper. You can do all these things, economies of scale for things like Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure around those lines. but um, this is kind of this need for trust transitions into the issue that we're in this global cybersecurity issue, right? It's a full global cybersecurity crisis across the board. Um, and you look every day, you can look at the news, search ex anything, and then write hack. You'll see like the list is, just goes on and on of all the data breaches because inherently in these systems, there's trust. And there's these centralized choke points of failure that becomes these vulnerabilities for these use cases. So taking that, abstracting away and using a blockchain as a permission system, that magic spreadsheet of who has what stuff at what time is pretty special. And uh, it's ownership, it's self-custody, it's the ability to really not have to inherently trust a third party. You can trust yourself um, with your data, whether that's mission critical data whether that's your memes, whether that's uh, files or birth certificates, things like that. Um, you just have a really, really, really strong place to store your stuff. Um, so that's kind of the transition out of Inquisitive Intel and into Jackal Labs. No, that's great. You kind of, you started to speak on exactly what Jackal Protocol does. So mm -hmm. kind of walk us through that maybe step by step. Who would be the ideal person to want to use? I mean, obviously storing memes, that might be me. But you know, you're probably looking for somebody, you know, the enterprise level clients, like what kinds of um, people are you targeting? You know, who, who would be best served by using Jackal Protocol and the technology stack that you guys have built? Of course. And it's a really difficult question to answer, right? Because when you look at something that's as low level as the storage layer, it, it's, it's malleable in all kinds of different directions where all, everyone has different value propositions and they see the product in a different way. For example, if I'm working with an enterprise, um, often they don't really care about the ownership side of things because the ex user experience isn't really that great yet. And they, they want service level agreements and contracts rather than the code being the, the contract for that, right? So what they see value in Jackal is specifically the concept that you have geo redundant storage, it auto heals, and you have this ridiculously high security posture. So for things like backups or ransomware defense or things along those lines, they're excited about that. Um, and they want to sign contracts and use an API rather than kind of inter interact with the blockchain directly. 
So you kind of need this like what 2.5 bridge. The so that's kind of what they value is the geo redundancy, the security, the auto healing, all that stuff. Um, blockchain companies kind of B2B in that direction is a little bit different where they kind of value speeds. They value ownership and decentralization and sovereignty and security posture as well. But uh, what they like is the ability to like interact with it on chain and it's there natively and they can just call a contract and it just seamlessly integrates with their application um, as blockchain is meant to and they value that kind of using it as a cloud environment the users on the other hand they have a little bit different like the individuals at the business the customer users that might be storing memes or folders of like pdf documents or something like that um what they value they kind of get to this magic moment when they interact with the jaco protocol is they show up they get their Jackal tokens, which is kind of like the work token or the commodity that powers the ecosystem and it's a medium of exchange for storage. They kind of go into this Dropbox looking like application, they drag and drop their file in, they pay for their storage account and pay for a storage deal and they shoot the file up into the cloud. The magic moment for them is after they do that process, they come to this realization that I'm the only person in the entire world that has access to this file. There's no third party, there's no middleman, there's no intermediary. We write the code, you can see the code. There's, there's no need for really trust in the system. And it's kind of a return to ownership and return to kind of really high security. And it's my stuff, it's my files. We used to have them kind of in filing cabinets or used to host everything locally for your company. But we kind of have, have this return to normalcy or return to sanity when it comes to just privacy ownership and uh, cybersecurity posture, which is pretty exciting in my opinion. Yeah, that's a really good overview. And, you know, one of the things too, I think a lot of people hear the the phrase decentralized storage, for instance, mm -hmm. immediately they think of something like Filecoin. Of course. And, you know, it that's a very, for those who don't know, if you're listening or watching, that's a really kind of intense process that includes proof of work and sealing off data and everything else. And retrieval is a, a huge issue with a mm -hmm. system like that. But what you guys have designed with Jackal protocol is quite different. You want to explain that a little bit more? Yeah. The, the competitive landscape is, um, is pretty interesting. And since it's so early and we're all so young, we're all kind of each storage project is kind of in a niche of one in our own really specific niche. Right. Filecoin, what they do really well is like cold storage archiving. Um, it's really cheap, but it takes 24 hours to get your files back. So if you're trying to move all this data and you're like, I don't really want this on my service anymore. I'm going to put it over there. And then it goes into this iceberg type storage where it takes 24 hours to get the files back. And that's kind of the awesome use case that they have is for putting data to rest for a really long time. There's some other nuances where they're kind of more of a marketplace. Jackal is more of a service offering. But uh, that is, that, that's kind of the difference there. Um, with Jackal, what we did is we kind of have a little bit of a last mover's advantage when it comes to the tech stack that we're able to choose. Um, back when a lot of these storage uh, protocols started, it was like these slow proof of work blockchains, as you mentioned, where you have these really long block times and it's not exactly fast and you don't have like permissions or the ownership side of things or programmable privacy or a lot of the features that a lot of people crave in an active cloud environment, something that you would use like a Google Cloud or a Dropbox or something along those lines. So ha having the technology that we had today, we had a really unique opportunity when we started in 2022, where we looked at where kind of people have had to choose a niche because of the technical constraints that were offered to them at the specific time that they started. But uh, at the time we started, we had modular blockchains and proof of stake speeds, and we had tender making census and the ability to build the protocol and into the actual meat and bones of the protocol itself. We can build like the storage module and the file tree module. So everything can be managed on chain, which extracts away a lot of um, kind of more management on the user side. So you don't have to kind of manage all your storage deals locally, or if I want privacy, I have to fumble around encryption keys locally, or if I want kind of speeds, I have to wait a really long time. So we had a, a few competitive advantages just by having, um, being able to observe and just see the tech stacks that were available to us now. 
You talked about programmable privacy. This is, a, I'm a big fan of alliteration. And, you know, this is something I think is, is a unique differentiator for Jackal. Can you expand on that a little bit more about what programmable privacy looks like? Yeah, so programmable privacy. So right now in kind of like the storage space, you take a file and you shoot it up to the protocol and it's just there, right? So imagine like I had like the finder of my Mac. I, I'm a Mac user, so I have the finder. Some people have whatever file tree you tend to use. Um, imagine I could just go and look at Ryan's just finder and just see all the names of the files and just click them and be like, oh, like that's interesting. Ryan has that photo or that meme. There. So that's uh, that's kind of the current state that storage on blockchain Rails was. Um, now that we kind of have all these different ways that we can do programmable privacy, but also ownership and permissions of the data, once you have permissions and file trees built into the chain directly with encryption layered on top, we can actually start to do other things where you can do peer-to-peer -peer sharing with the middleman, or uh, we can do other things where I can, I'm the only person that has access to my file if I choose that using kind of integrated encryption schemes. In blockchains, um, there's no username and password, right? We have public keys and private keys. And the, all the kind of authentication happens locally on the end user's computer rather than on our servers, for example. That being said, we have this ability to kind of layer on encryption and then use integrated encryption schemes with elliptic curves to actually create unique encryption schemes on each individual file, which is pretty interesting. So every file is encrypted differently, and then you have to use your private key to decrypt those files when you download them from the network. Um, anyone can pull any file down from the network, but the ability to decrypt it, um, you either need a quantum computer or you need to physically harm the other person because of private keys. So that's uh, kind of the security posture that we're in right now. No, that's really incredible. I mean, it just seems like you guys have thought of every facet of what this should look like in the future. So thinking about that, where where do you see all of this going? Where do you see the decentralized storage space going? Like what's next for, for Jackal Protocol, things that maybe you guys are building out or looking to integrate in the coming months or within the next year? Yeah, um, on the we kind of see Jackal as like two different products. There's like the Web 2 side of things or the Web 2.5 side of things and the Web 3 side of things. So where we're going on the Web 2 side of things, uh, we found use cases specifically with telecom companies and their backups. Um, we've also found use cases with CCTV camera footage where it's just like super expensive to store that in an active cloud. Having a way to either back that up or use Jackal as an active cloud environment for their use cases. Um, that's awesome. And that's kind of its own journey where we kind of really deliver geo-distributed storage, which is just really, it's up to $200 a month per terabyte when you use traditional systems, if you want like three times multi-region redundancy. So there's a lot of value there. Um, on the blockchain side, the way that kind of the landscape of blockchains are set up right now is the storage L1s are in a vicious battle in the zero sum game with like other just generic L1 blockchains, whether that's Ethereum or Arbitrum or Optimism or Archway with, from, you spoke with Griffin recently or uh, Juno and all these kind of smart contract L1 blockchains. It's a zero sum game. So if I'm a developer on let's say Archway and I want scalable data storage, my options are either I use a Microsoft pinning service and then pin the IPFS, which is, that's okay. I just need a server and it's a centralized choke point of failure. And you kind of have some drawbacks of that, or I have to like pick up my entire project and then I have to move to a monolithic storage L1. Um, so they're kind of in this battle for the same users and same developers. And we don't really think that way. Uh, we want to provide value to L1 blockchain. So, Instead of fighting them for the same developers and users, we can deploy these things that we call outposts um, using this kind of inner blockchain communication technology where we can send like data, arbitrary data packets between a bunch of blockchains. Um, so locally, everyone that's building there, if we deploy an outpost on Archway, for example, they just get all the value of Jackal locally with a simple smart contract call instead of us trying to drag them over to our storage blockchain and steal them away from another ecosystem. Uh, we think that kind of goes into marketplace versus service. It kind of goes into a bunch of other different things, but 
the ability to provide value rather than kind of fight in a zero sum game. Uh, we're excited about that. So that's kind of where our future is um, on kind of like a product roadmap side. Feature side, uh, it's just kind of trying to get 1% better every day for our guys internally and make sure that we can just continue to just move the ball down the field on the Jackal protocol development front. Um, that's kind of the way that I see the storage kind of landscape right now would be a good way to put it. But uh, yeah, I think that's pretty much everything, right? No, and I love that 1%, you know, getting better 1% every day. That's that's really a, a great way to operate and just sort of a, a mindset to have, especially with a, a team that you've you've built around you. Um, thank you so much for taking the time to give us this incredible overview of Jackal Protocol and what you guys are building. What's the best way for people to reach out? If they want to learn more about Jackal Labs or Jackal Protocol itself, like how do they get in touch with you? Um, of course, we'll have links to the website and everything else when these go online so people can can quickly access them. But, but like getting in touch with you personally, like what's the best way to go about it? Yeah, the uh, easiest way is um, you can just go to the jackalabs.io website, um, just put in an inquiry, and then we can get back to you pretty, pretty quickly. We're usually on the ball there. Uh, you can message me on LinkedIn directly. You can message me on Twitter directly. I, uh, I'm, I'm pretty available. I try to be as available as possible to everyone. So um, after this, we can get a bunch of links, and we can just jam them down in the description for you. Yeah, sounds great. We will definitely have those available. Again, Patrick Dunlap from uh, Jackal Labs here with us today. Thank you so much for taking the time to have this conversation. I think it was a great overview and hopefully a lot of people are going to be quite interested in what you guys are building, especially some of those enterprise customers. So thanks so much, everybody, for who's been tuning in and listening or watching today's podcast. We'll see you again real soon. Take care.